I grew up in a musical family. My mom was a choir director. And so I started taking piano lessons when I was like five years old. So I guess I was kind of musical from a young age. But oddly enough, I decided, first of all, that I wanted to be a chemist. And then, I, then after that, I thought, well, maybe I want to be an architect. And so I really wasn't looking at music as a career. But then when I was in high school, I started feeling like music was more and more something that I really enjoyed. And wouldn't it be great if I could work at something that I really enjoy? I ended up going to the University of North Texas uh, with a, as a composition major. And I thought, well, if I get a degree in composition, then at least I'll know how to work with the orchestra because it was orchestral film sco scores that were really, really exciting to me. And, after, and so I did that and got my bachelor's there. And then I went to uh, the program at USC, the film scoring program that they have at USC to study specifically film composition. Studied with some wonderful people there, Bruce Broughton, David Rexon, master classes with Jerry Goldsmith and things like that. And that was very inspiring to me and I knew I was on the right path. So that's kind of how I made it from the Midwest to Los Angeles. How did I get in film and TV music? Um, I didn't necessarily set out to be a film composer. I grew up in Portland, Oregon. I'm the youngest of three. I have a brother, Alberts, and a sister, Brigitte. And Brigitte was my first piano teacher. Um, my parents, Anders and Asya Ritmanis, immigrated from Latvia after World War II. The whole family was involved in a pop music group, a Latvian pop music group, and in that group I wrote songs and uh, played the bass guitar. We did a bit of touring. I went to Cleveland High School where I was in a jazz band and performed in some of the musicals and sang in the choir. It was a wonderful, wonderful public high school that just had a great music program. Another part of my childhood and my high school years and is very much a part of my life now still is being involved in the Latvian music community. Uh, every year there's a song festival somewhere in the world and of course in Latvia now there are the huge song festivals but I have the opportunity to write music and have it performed um, either conducting myself or having other other people perform my music at these festivals so that's been a great place for me to have my works performed. When it came time to look for a college to attend my family and I found a school called the Dick Grove School School of Music down here in Studio City, a professional music school that Dick Grove ran. I completed the composing and arranging program as well as the film music program. Every week we would have our works performed and it was very much like a real life situation so that that really prepared me well after school when I had an opportunity to start working as a music proofreader and later orchestrator for Michael Kamen. I orchestrated for Mark Snow. Uh, and there's kind of a long list of people, but at that point I was surrounded by brilliant composers who were teaching there, and I just really got the bug. And so it, it really happened pretty early on. Um, I grew up in a little town in West Texas and uh, started playing the piano when I was five. And I think that when I was in high school, also I finally I sort of decided, you know what, I think that music is something that's really what I want to do. I can't imagine being anywhere else. I can't imagine doing anything else with my life. Um, and hopefully I can make, actually make a living at it too. Mm. Um, so uh, in checking out different schools to go to, I also ended up going to the University of North Texas. Michael and I had the same piano teacher and the same composition teacher. And uh, I think this is kind of quite a coincidence because maybe some schools might only have one piano teacher or one composition teacher. Uh, North Texas actually has a gigantic music department, so the fact that we ended up in the same, kind of with the same background, I thought was really funny, although we didn't know each other there. No, not at all. Also, I still play the piano, I also played the double bass, and I thought, well, um, I don't believe I'm quite good enough to make a living as a pianist, nor a double bass player, so I guess it's a good thing that I like to write music. <laughs> and <laughs> While I was there, I, I um, made connections with the film department and scored some of the student films, and um, had an opportunity right when I graduated to come out and uh, visit Los Angeles and visit Shirley Walker and I met Michael and eventually Lolita. Well we didn't know each other when Shirley hired us initially. Um, she hired me as a composer for her and she hired Lolita as a composer for her and we actually met on the way to uh, one of our meetings with Shirley to show her our work because she would always review all the composers work before it would go to the scoring stage so Lolita and I discovered that we sort of lived in the same general area and we decided to pool our resources and do a carpool over to Shirley's place and then that's how we kind of got to know each other I think. Isn't that right? Well the, the early 80s um, it was 
very exciting in Los Angeles. The the orchestra there was orchestras pretty much playing in all the major studios. Right. Um, and I was approached um, by Shirley through the late Patty Zamiti, who was a, a music contractor. Shirley was putting together kind of a stable of composers to be able to help her and, in essence, mentor these composers. And I don't think any of us really knew what an, an amazing opportunity that was because it, it was pretty much unheard of that a composer of, of her caliber calls these quote-unquote up-and-coming composers and invites them to, hey, I'm going to give you some music to write and actually you'll get credit yeah. and uh, and I will mentor you along the way. So it was it was a paid apprenticeship in essence. And it was your and my first opportunity to work professionally I think as composers was it not? Well I had done, I was working a lot as an orchestrator and, and uh, did some ghostwriting and right. worked on, on big features and also worked at, at um, the music library doing proofreading and all sorts of miscellaneous tasks mm -hmm. so um, the composing as far as having my name on the screen I think that was the first big opportunity well it, it was certainly my first professional gig as a composer um, working with an orchestra and doing doing what I love to do it was the first time I ever got a chance to do that and it was because of Shirley so it was pretty amazing it wasn't really uh, handed to us per se on a silver platter we really had we, we didn't just jump in and write an episode we started by orchestrating and uh, it was, she was very meticulous and, and mm -hmm. demanding and uh, had, things had to be a certain way and we, sh we at first could not overstep the line. She was definitely the boss and uh, at, as we progressed in the process, we got a little bit more, she gave us a little more rope. Okay, here, you do a little bit more and uh, it was, it went from orchestrating to eventually standing on the podium conducting our own music and and everyone knew it was it was our music but it was under her guidance and and chris also had the opportunity it came a little bit later a couple of years later or right. much near the end I near mean, the, the end the um the series was on and a favorite among in the dorm that i lived in so that that i was i was already watching it and very inspired from it when i was in college and um i had known um shirley's son ian who's a fantastic bass player and uh, in talking with him and having familiarizing him with the work that I had done, he uh, agreed to open the door to meet Shirley, and um, she invited me out after I graduated. And uh, so I began in that same path, orchestrating, observing, and then just gradually was given a chance to do a little bit of writing too. Well, I think part of the reason I, I still think it's a good episode musically is because it was my first big solo episode. And so here I am coming into the scene and having an opportunity to say everything I've ever wanted to say <laughs> in, uh, in, you know, probably 15 minutes worth of music. And I don't, I think I had, I don't know, two or three weeks to write this music where now, you know, we have a couple days. Yeah, a couple days. Um, but it was, I knew I would have access to the most fabulous musicians. I mean, the Los Angeles musicians are just phenomenal and record on a great stage and have Shirley there to support me. And uh, the, rest of the, the rest of the team, Mike and I already had become really good friends mm -hmm. by that time. Um, so I was ready. Um, I don't think I did anything that extremely inventive. I just kind of drew on what I thought would be the right tone for the piece and it because it had that dark kind of mysterious thing. I mean all Batman is kind of dark, but this particular mood had had definitely the film noir aspect to it. And uh I just I thoroughly enjoyed it. I enjoyed uh using the the live musicians and the the uh kind of energy that they could infuse into this very uh kind of seductive seductive gangstery score. The first three episodes were conceived as a movie, so I think it was really important to set the tone with those first three episodes. And Shirley was supervising this series. By that time, she had called down the people that had gone through the process with Batman to pretty much just um, myself and Lolita and Chris and Harvey Cohen. And we knew that the four of us would be sort of doing this series with Shirley. And she always set the tone of the series and she wrote the themes for the characters. So she was very much in charge of setting that musical sound for the series. And we knew that, as you said, the series was brighter and had, it was more colorful 
and because it's Superman, it had more more range. I mean, you, it didn't always stay in that darker place. So we kind of felt like we could stretch a little and do a little bit more with it. Um, she had provided a Superman theme already, and so we tried to incorporate that wherever we could. And uh, I think you know we were really excited that it was going to be the four of us and that we were going to do the whole series. It, it was very very exciting. <laughs> Batman Beyond theme was part of a series of submissions that all of us had made because of the fact that uh, the producers wanted to go in a different direction. They, they had said that they envisioned the music being very different than what we had done for Batman and Superman and in fact had uh, been skeptical that we were capable of doing that because we were the orchestral guys. And um, I think Shirley was very astute to say, you know what? we can do this, let's do it. And so we prepared a demo piece, actually a cassette at the time, wasn't it? Uh, What's that? A CD? Uh, a demo, <laughs> demo, demo tape. We, a demo we made tape. a demo tape um, of a lot of different pieces and they all, I think, captured the essence of that, the futuristic, the, the kind of grungy techno. Um, it just so happened that that one particular piece, uh, Bruce, had, Tim, the producer, had kind of gravitated towards and chose to be the theme but it actually was a collaboration of all of us to kind of create that sound. Our collaboration is really more of a support system for each other. We don't, we have rarely actually written the same, on the same piece of music. Sometimes we'll write a song together, but these, uh, I know we did, we did orchestrate some mm -hmm. for each other on these things. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, but for the most part, those were m much more solo endeavors. I would say it was kind of our. It was okay. Now it's your turn. It's your turn. It's your turn. And and mm -hmm. uh, it was. Uh, it was. We didn't really collaborate as much as we do now. But we were there for each other. And I mean, since we had already worked together so much throughout these other series, we knew we could count on each other. And we knew that there were various different roles in the music team process that needed to be filled by people that we could trust. And so knowing that we could really count on each other and that we kind of understood each other's musical voice and where we were coming from, I think it was just terrific that we could actually kind of cross-pollinate a little bit when it came time to record the score or orchestrate or something like that and make use of, of each other on, on the music team and make our own music team and still choose each other. It surely wasn't, at least I don't know how it was for you guys, but for Mystery of the Batwoman, she wasn't really supervising for me much on that. It was, no. it was, uh, I, I went, in, went in to meet with Alan Burnett and, and we would spot and, and bring him music to listen to and and it was just it was a back and forth with the producer mainly so it wasn't a... yeah Shirley really did step away for the movie projects to give us the freedom to you know especially creatively I mean we had to follow along with some of the conventions that had been established from the series that they're drawn from but we had the freedom I think to kind of inject our own personality into what we we're trying to achieve with the score it's funny because I actually invited her to the sessions for Sub Zero because I thought it would be really great to have her there. You know, just, just supportive and everything, and I think so much of her anyway. Um, and she kind of politely declined, <laughs> and she said, "No, I don't think I'm going to be there, but you go right ahead." And and I, I at first I was a little bit hurt, but then I realized that she was really, like Chris said, she was really stepping aside and letting us do our thing and 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 really be in charge. And she didn't really want to diffuse that at all, which I thought was really marvelous and wonderful of her. We were saving the universe every single episode and uh, so the music had to have that kind of, of scope to it and, um, and I think when we we started with Justice League to be a very traditional symphonic sound kind of plussing what we had done for Superman um, and then when we they rebranded it as Justice League Unlimited we um, we did shift the music into kind of to incorporating some I don't know would you say Little seventy rock elements I think yeah kind of retro rock in a way I mean it wasn't yeah. modern rock classic classic rock yeah, yeah. but I, the series started out um, being two part episodes so the arc and the way that the storytelling was was very different than what we'd done on Batman and Superman because we had this full hour for them to tell the story and for the plot to unfold and to really develop the characters. And that was really, that was a very good thing for the music because when you have a little bit more time like that, you can have a little bit more, the music has a little bit more to offer. And there isn't quite 
there's a more space between the action scenes and so there's more development of the plot and the characters and, and then the music can really come through there. So that was really great. When it went to Unlimited though, then things started to get more compressed and I think it was appropriate to have the rock elements come in at that point because things were more high energy, the editing was faster, the storytelling was faster and it all kind of gelled in, in a much different way. And, and I think they're very, they're, they're very distinct, the two different incarnations of that, I think, as a result of that. One other thing that is, uh, at least for me personally, was was fairly intense was that this series when we when we we did have to use samples and we would have these previews with Bruce Tim where we'd come and play our music back in the when we did the animated series we would just go to the session I don't think he he rarely came to the session it was right now occasionally and then, but... but it was uh, when we were in Justice League we actually there was a lot more of this back and forth and uh, Bruce is he's brilliant. He also gave me incredible panic attacks at times because he is very, <laughs> he has su he's such a visionary and if he could I know he would love to just be able to plug from his brain straight into the orchestra or into the synth and get the score. So it's it was it was kind of the jumping into the deep end of the pool of being in that room with such a presence mm. and having to you know, either defend your defend one's music or 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 watch him get teary eyed. Sorry, Bruce, if I'm you know if he, if he watches this, but just it's it, it was kind of like he loves me, he hates me, he loves me. He, so it was the music. It was it that passionate kind of interchange with this intense human being was uh, in large way I think what 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 shaped us and gave us a certain at least I feel like I definitely got a backbone from that experience of having to go through that process and this was we did that with Batman Beyond a little but it wasn't as it wasn't intense the same no because Justice League you know when you have the strings and you have the and things can breathe a certain way it's it's like it's either going to work or it's like Hmm, it's not working for him. So you know, we have a lot more of this exchange, and I and even though I, you know, I, it was kind of intense. It it was a good experience overall. Plus, we were each doing our individual episodes, so of course, you know, I would go for a spot session with Bruce, and he'd say, "Oh, you know, that thing that Mike did on the last episode, that was just great." <laughs> it's like. Okay, what about what I did? Or, or, or that he would tell Chris something that I did that he liked. And so it was, you know, we had this competitive thing. I think that's kind of when we started re to realize we better band together as a team. Yeah. <laughs>
and then you go back later and do the arrangements and the and the instrumentals and everything, but you have to record the vocalists first. I'm sounding shrill against my will and cannot stop this singing. And in my ears I swear I hear a quite distinctive ringing. This silly game is very lame and someone's going to pay. An unknown force, but where's the source that has us in its way? With this musical, when they even mention when James mentioned that he was going to do this, thinking about it. Uh, the turnaround time was very short, and uh, having worked on musicals before, I realized usually the writing process is at least about a year, and then there's all the revisions, and it was, I don't know, we had a couple of months, right? Total. Um, total. Yeah. yeah. But uh, James Tucker and Michael Jelinek wrote the lyrics, and there were basically, you know, these five... Right, five big numbers, right? It was, right. Yeah, five big numbers. Like cornerstones, yeah. And we each kind of... Did we did we pick? Did I get to pick? Did I get to do the ballad? I got to do the ballad. the ballad, which was fun. I really wanted, wanted to, do, to the do the ballad, and I wanted, wanted to do, do the it. Drives Us Bats song. The Batmobile is super fast. There is no car that is surpassed. It's a good thing we've got our gum, because he really drives us bats. Drives us bats, drives us bats. He really drives us bats, bats, bats. He drives us bats. The stars just aligned, and the fact that they could get, I mean, the cast of Brave and the Bold is wonderful anyway, um, but the fact that they could get Neil Patrick Harris in the leading role yeah. at that time uh, was just, uh, was such a godsend, and the this, this vocal sessions were were beyond uh, exciting, just to just to be around that ta that level of talent singing our music, and yeah. those guys are, they're, oh, they're so funny. Yes. Voice actors, they just they you, you're constantly laughing at the sessions because they're cracking jokes or throwing their voice or making funny sounds or little lewd humor, but uh, it was uh, the whole process was just fantastic. Well, I'd say right up there has to be the music meister just because of the scope of what we were doing and also also because James kind of charged us with having every song be a different style, so we really. I think when we're talking about gravitating toward things, we all kind of gravitated toward things that we really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you know for for the song that I did, he wanted kind of an old Hollywood musical, big screen, cinemascope musical kind of sound, and I was just I'm all into that. And I know that you know you enjoyed doing what you were doing, and but the entire series, it it it, it just it's so fun. Um, we just we did just rap. We gave uh, James a gift that was a signature for this series because whenever there was an action bit, he'd always ask for more bongos. So we actually gave yes. him some bongo, <laughs> yeah. bongo drums. But we also had uh, the great honor of, of working with uh, John Yoakum, who's a wonderful woodwind player, and he plays everything under the sun. He even bought a bassoon, but I don't think he's playing the bassoon yet. But we we would be able to have that that human element of... You know, an interesting baritone saxophone solo for one of the villains, or a, a little piccolo thing for you know some funny bit. And so, having that 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 soloist added a great deal in in, in our process. We also worked with uh, Greg Herzenach, who's a phenomenal guitar player, and we've we've worked on mini series with him. He also played with us on Teen Titans, and um, Beyond, he did some some of the Batman Beyond guitars as well. I think one of the strengths of Dynamic Music Partners is that we have three independent studios that can all work simultaneously. We create the music there and then we are assisted by our wonderful engineers Mark Matson and Mako Sujishi who lend their golden ears to help make the final polished product. Well, I think once again we have a really great cast on this series and their vocal performances are really strong. So emotionally everything is pretty much there. I know that with this series we were charged with the responsibility of, of making something that sounded very futuristic and not really like the other orchestral type things that we have done. So we on purpose will ch make choices that are kind of out of the box and different and the way that we use the orchestra in the series is also very different than anything we've ever done. Um, and the, the goal is always to enhance the story and always to provide some level of emotion that, that maybe needs to just be there to enhance everything. Uh, there's not a lot to enhance emotionally because it's already pretty much there. Well, and we have a, a great opportunity because we actually spot the show with um, with Brandon Vietti and Greg Weissman. And Greg is 
more about the words that have been written and how what the characters need to be feeling at the time, uh, what we need to feel when we're we're well, right. storyline. And Brandon is is kind. I would say he's more about kind of the overall arc of a certain moment. And he had he had Brandon had very definite ideas of what the tone of the show should be. So um, it really some some composers don't like to have that much guidance, but for us in this situation. Brandon had a real clear vision of the t the kind of tone he was looking for for this, and it, it did need to have a different kind of feel. Yeah, this series was really all about mood. It's about setting a mood and and keeping an ambience for the for the drama and the story to happen within. And so our goal as the composers is not really to be so specific about the emotions, but to really just more of set of an overall tone for each of the scenes. on Ben 10, Alien Force, and Ultimate Alien with Glenn Murakami, who we had developed a relationship with on Teen Titans. And he is, is such a visionary. He, he was tasked to kind of help evolve the very popular Ben 10 character in that, that universe. And something that he was really drawn to musically was more, um, more chamber-driven, something that's uh, chamber music like you would have had in a TV series maybe in the 60s, like a, the Twilight Zone or the, the Outer Limits, and something that's a lot more, um, I'll say sophisticated in terms of the, the, the tone. And uh, we thought it was such a, a very inspiring departure from, I think, the way a lot of the, or the orchestra is used in a lot of series today. Yeah, Glenn has a, a gift of al allowing the composer to feel like it's okay to stretch and Instead of feeling like, oh, I have to fit in this box, I have to do this, I have to do the John Williams thing, or I have to do the this thing or the that thing. With Glenn, sometimes he'll just, yeah, it's kind of strange. Or he'll just say something, <laughs> and, and it'll just be an inspiration to just take it. We do draw a lot of inspiration from the, the art. I mean, every one of these series, it's still Superman, it's still Green Lantern, but the way he's drawn, the way he's acted, those, those give us a lot of information of, of what we want to try and how we want to make it evolve, too. We just need more superheroes now. And when I, when I hear of the fact that, um, I have some friends in Latvia who, who said, oh, my, my grandchildren watch Ben 10, and they know all the Ben 10 music. And, and I think about these little kids running around, and times may be tough, but there's some some hope that they're getting out of the, out of the the fact that there's this character, there's a character that can become more than just what you see on the outside, and that our music can somehow help translate that and and become kind of a universal thing is 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 quite a big task, and it it, it feels sometimes like it's it's a responsibility. So. You know, it's not just Superman and Batman, but it's, you know, everybody out there who has a little bit of that kind of something to be a better some, somebody. Yeah, I think it's also our responsibility to, to keep our music evolving as the series continue because, sure, we started out writing for Batman and we are still writing for Batman all these years later, but every series presents a new challenge. And for us as creative people, you know, it's our obligation to do something different, something fresh, something unique, so that we can show a different side of each of these characters as the characters themselves evolve. Um, the shows have, have, are edited differently. They have a different pace now than they did 20 years ago. Certainly there's much more music in the shows now than there was uh, 20 years ago. When we started on Batman, the average length of a score would be maybe 12 minutes. And now for Batman Brave and the Bold, the average length of the score is 17 to 18 minutes for the, for the show out of 22 minutes. So I think with that, you know, there's more opportunity there to tell a story with music. And each time we are able to, to do a new series, it presents 
a new challenge and a new world and a new way for us to express ourselves. Uh, we couldn't be more excited that we are as busy as ever. Some things we can't talk about right now, but what we can mention is that we just finished work on an all-CGI movie called Ben 10 Destroy All Aliens. It brought us back together with our spectacular Spider-Man producer, uh, Vic Cook. And we're also looking forward to beginning our next season of Warner Brothers' Young Justice, which is produced by Brandon Vietti and Greg Wiseman. Dynamic Music Partners has allowed us to maintain a quality of our life outside of our work from the way that we support each other and the way we manage our projects that I, th I think is unique in, in Hollywood. I, we're not scrambling, I think, in the way to just do the work. We're able to, to enhance our own life as composers, as people outside of being a composer. Since we've worked together for so long now, it's been 20 years. So, I mean, there's, a, there's an element of trust between us, um, similar to what we were talking about with the different movies that we were doing. Only on the series that we do now, we're all on board on every series, and we all split every episode, and it really it helps us bring a great deal of quality to, to each episode because there isn't that feeling of, of scramble or uh, it also helps keep the music fresh and keeps the scenes fresh within the episode so that one person doesn't ever feel too overwhelmed by one thing or another. We're really dividing up the work equally between us and, and so we have a smaller amount of work on each episode and then we can do more with that. I think it keeps the, the level of, music, of musicianship really high and the level of composing pretty high. And we inspire each other. I'm yeah, oh my God. Yeah, I have to say, um, <laughs> I really don't know of two more talented people than, than Chris and Mike. It's just, it's such an honor to work with them. And I know they feel that way about me too, but I they honestly do, say I, I, I totally trust them. If there's, if, as far as the music goes, I, I think that they're, they're brilliant. And it's, it's quite inspiring to work with people that you actually are inspired by. And uh, I know that my, my kids often comment about the fact that I seem to really like what I do. And I think, the fact that um, they have allowed me to also be a mom. I have three kids now; they'll all be in college and and married for. I've been married for twenty two years. Um, having that sanity um, and knowing that I'm, they've got my back. So it's great. It's a great atmosphere. And in a certain way, I, I think inspirationally, because I certainly have the utmost respect for both of your music. I mean, it's just. I, I love listening to your music, which is saying something, because I don't often listen to a lot of people's music. But I love listening to your guys' music. And, you know, every now and then when you kind of feel like, oh, I've been doing this for a while now, and you kind of feel like you want to relax, and they don't hear something that Lolita did or something that Chris did that's just great, that blows me away, and I'll just think, you know what? I got to get with it. <laughs> I got to I got to really I got to step yeah. up, you know? It's like I you, you, I don't really feel like I want to relax or I want to you know let 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 things kind of slide a little bit. I'm always wanting to be on my toes and that's that's a great thing for a creative person to always feel like you you want to be right there with it. You want you you're inspired by what's around you and you want to come up to that level. I always feel like I I'm I'm rising to the occasion when I'm working with these two guys. Yeah.